Hello, hello everybody, it's your boy Prof Trof, and we're back again with another Mad Lads video. This has been suggested a, a lot, a lot, a lot, a very much lot. That's not, that's not how you, okay, whatever. Uh, this is actual Mad Lads, you, you, you die, Hussein? You die? You die? I... Some of you might be unfortunate enough to know a spoiled brat. Someone who had a rich and powerful daddy and when they were growing up they got given whatever they wanted and that in turn turned them into an arrogant, insufferable douchebag. But some brat's fathers are so powerful that the brat doesn't just get whatever they want, they can do whatever they want. And that can be quite a deadly combination, especially when the spoiled brat in question is one of the most violent psychopaths that the world has ever seen. Oh shit. The Ace of Hearts. Uday Hussein. Uday. I missed this fucking intro. But before Shadow we Legends. get into the mad lad, it's your boy, Raid Shadow Legends. This hot and funky fresh top of the charts mobile game has over 400 champions for you to collect from 16 different factions and with over 1 that million like different builds. With over 300,000 reviews, Raid has almost a perfect score on the Play Store. You can play through the fully voiced story campaign or fight each other in the PvP arena. You can also you can play through the fully voiced story campaign or fight each other in the PvP. Is that Zyra? PvP arena. You can also go go on raids with friends. Okay. The developers Champions have much cool. more planned for the game as they have detailed in this roadmap they've created, showing all of the future content they plan to add to the game. They aren't making this a one and done game. They plan on going in for the long haul. So if you click on my link in the video description, you will get a hundred thousand silver and a free epic champion, Hexweaver, as part of the new player program. Oh! Hexweaver is actually pretty goddamn OP, and she saved my ass. She's very um shiny. On more than one occasion, and this offer is only available for the next thirty days if you use my link down below. Click the link. Click the link. Oh well. Click the link. Like the link. Uday Saddam Hussein Al Tikriti was born on the 18th of June. What? 19th. How many names does he have? Yo. The link. Uday Saddam Hussein Al Tikriti was born on the 18th of June 1964, and he was the eldest son of his mother Sajida Talfa and his father Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein actually missed Uday's birth because at the time Saddam was in prison for his part in an assassination plot. It's also probably important to point out that Saddam and Sajida were first cousins, which might kind of explain how Uday turned out the way he did. And then, in 1979, oh, Saddam Hussein became president of Iraq when Uday was just 15 years old. Now, we all know what Saddam Hussein was like. He was violent, he was ruthless, he was brutal, he amassed a lot of stolen wealth, amassed a lot of power, and he was feared all throughout Iraq, and no one dared question his authority because they knew there would be extreme consequences for it. And people felt the exact same way about Uday. Growing up this way obviously had an effect on how Uday turned out. He was given whatever he wanted, he was allowed to do whatever he wanted, and he had an army of servants and yes-men who would do whatever he asked without question, out of fear of what Saddam might do to them should they upset his firstborn son, because if there's one thing that you definitely don't want to do is piss off the son of a brutal dictator. As Uday grew up, he acted the exact same way that any rich spoiled brat would. He partied constantly, slept with a lot of women, he amassed fleets of luxury cars, designer clothes, Rolex watches, gold, silver, you know, anything designer, anything posh, anything expensive, you name it, Uday bought it. And it was all bought with daddy's money. The main things that Uday liked to buy was expensive French suits, Rolex watches and expensive very... What? The main things that Uday liked to buy was expensive French suits, Rolex French watches suits, and okay. very high-end colognes. He was extremely obsessed with his appearance and he was probably one of the vainest 
people to ever have existed. His vanity was so Jesus. bad that if any member of his staff wore an item of clothing that Udi possessed, Udi would demand that they take it off and never wear it again, even if they weren't. Okay, that's not that bad. I thought it was going to kill him, okay? It's not that bad. In Udi's company. Udi surrounded himself with a hand-picked elite team of bodyguards who he made sure were absolutely devoted, loyal fanatics of him who would carry out any order he gave them without question. This all sounds like... Hey, one sec, one sec. Okay, we're back, sorry about Like that. normal behaviour that you would expect from your everyday rich, spoiled brat. But Udi was not your everyday rich, spoiled brat. He was a spoiled brat that was raised in Saddam-era Iraq. He was the son of Saddam Hussein, and being the son of Saddam Hussein gave you the power to do anything you wanted. Okay. Anything. So because Udi was the son of Saddam Hussein, Udi witnessed a lot of atrocities while he was growing up, everything from torturing to executions, and Udi idolised his father and wanted to be just like him, not just in power and wealth, but in brutality. Whenever Udi went to a nightclub or party, he would order his bodyguards to find all of the beautiful women in the place and line them up in front of him. Udi would inspect all of the girls to see who was the prettiest and he would choose one or two of them to accompany him back to his bedroom. Wow. And the girls didn't really have a choice. In 1983, That's at a party, cool. Udi wanted to dance with the wife of an army officer. The army officer refused and said to Udi, you're not dancing. He dead. He dead. He dead. ...with my wife because this army officer wasn't no cuck. Unfortunately, Udi flew into a rage and started savagely beating the army officer so badly that a few days later, the army officer died of his wounds. There was also another incident where an army officer forgot to salute Udi. So Udi just pulled his gun out and shot him. At parties, Udi was also very well known for just randomly firing his AK-47 around the room because he felt like it. Wait, there, there is a video of this. That's him. All right. I like how he puts the uh, things, the uh, ear pods, so he doesn't damage his hearing. It's like he's pretending. Right, at least he didn't go full auto. There are very many horrific things that Udi did, but first we need to ask ourselves, how do we know all of this information? Because no doubt a lot of these horrible things took place behind closed doors and were hidden by the Saddam regime okay. so that this information didn't make it into the out. One of his bodyguards, I guess, or just told us because he did not give a fuck? Side world. Well, the reason we actually know all of this information is because we had a very, very good source Probably one of the best sources that you could get on Udi Hussein. Okay. One thing that was very, very common in Saddam era Iraq was assassination attempts on its elite. There was even many assassination attempts on Saddam himself, so the elite, to counteract this and reduce the risk of them being assassinated, would use body doubles. Saddam oh. personally had several body doubles. Oh. Body doubles were referred to in Arabic as fidai, or more colloquially, better known as bullet catchers. And Udi <laughs> wanted his own body double. And Udi's body double is our source. Oh. Now, the story of Udi's body double is an entire saga in itself, but I absolutely have to tell it, purely okay. because it offers a great insight into what Udi Hussein was really like. So when Udi was trying to think of who would be a good choice to be his body double... Udi remembered someone who was in his class when he was at school who looked an awful lot like him. And that person was a man named Poor. Latif Yahya, who was now a grown man, currently serving in the Iraqi army, and he was actually on the front lines fighting in the Iran-Iraq war. So Udi Hussein sent a message to the front lines ordering that Latif Yahya be excused from service and he was to attend the royal palace immediately. So Latif attended the royal palace Did and was like greeted by Udi. Udi took Latif into his office and just outright asked him, do you want to be my body double? Now, Latif was no idiot and he was an army man who'd seen a lot of combat. 
And he definitely knew the great risks involved in being the body. I mean, okay, listen. Can you say no, though? I don't think he can say no. I think he's dead if he said, well, probably not dead, but I don't think he can even say no to this. For one of the so. most hated men in all of Iraq. But Latif also knew that this was Uday Hussein. And you don't say no yeah. to Uday Hussein. So Latif asked him, do I have a choice? And huh. Uday responded, my huh. friend, Cheeky. Habibi, of course you <laughs> have a choice. <laughs> so Latif, knowing that his uh, life most likely would be cut very short by being Uday's <laughs> body double, thanked him for the opportunity and refused the job. Udi immediately put him in prison. Latif was thrown into a cell that was only one meter by one meter so that he couldn't lie down to go to sleep. Oh. The cell was also painted completely red and it had a big bright light in the ceiling that was oh. permanently on to make it even harder for him to sleep. Uh, Latif was also kept awake at night by the sounds of prisoners being tortured. A week later, the cell door opened and it was Udi Hussein. And Udi gave Latif an ultimatum. He told him that Latif would be his body double or Uday would rape his sisters. Oh! Jesus Christ! I thought I was gonna be like, hey, if you're not my double double, you know, pow, 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 you know, pow, pow. It's gonna kill him. Nope. I guess killing him is a little too light. Jesus fucking Christ. Latif agreed to be Uday's body double. When Latif was released, he was handed over <laughs> oh, to a man oh, called Munen oh, Hamid. Oh, sorry, but I was I was about to pause it, but I couldn't fast enough. Oh fuck, sorry. Oh. Who was going to act as Latif's handler and trainer in order to prepare him for becoming Uday? Latif was then brought to the royal palace and was actually given his own room, and this room contained things like silk bed sheets, designer French suits, Rolex watches, fancy colognes, all of the things that Uday also wore and used this was to prepare yeah. him for becoming Udi and this might sound nice and lovely but this room also doubled as his prison cell as in he wasn't allowed to leave Oof. unless Udi said so Latif actually called this room his golden cage Latif wanted to contact his like family princess. to let them know that he was okay because as far as they knew he just completely disappeared off the face of the earth from the front lines but when he asked if he could contact them Munem Hamid told him that. Oh, one second, they one second. Okay, we're back. He had already contacted his family and told them that he died in combat and had become a martyr. Munem also <sighs> told him that he was to have no contact whatsoever with his old life and he was to leave it behind completely. And then Munem told him, You are not Latif, you are Uday. Now, Latif already looked a lot like Udi, but he didn't look exactly like Udi. So oh, they took no. him to a plastic surgeon to give him a complete reconstruction so that he would look like an exact carbon copy of Udi. They completely restructured his chin, his teeth, and many other things in order to make him look more like Udi Hussein. And all of this was obviously done without Latif's consent. Latif then went through weeks and weeks of grueling training to master absolutely everything about Uday's mannerisms. His body language, the way he talked, the way he walked, phrases he would use, everything all the way down to the way Uday would smoke a cigar. Latif had to do it exactly like Uday would do it. Latif had to be an exact mirror image of Uday. Latif was then told Jesus. that he was going to be taken to Saddam Hussein himself for an inspection so that he could get Saddam's approval to being Uday's body double. Now, Latif was wondering what would happen to him if he didn't get Saddam's yeah. approval. So, <laughs> Latif was obviously shitting himself, but he was brought before Saddam. Saddam inspected him head to toe, and Saddam said to him, Very good. Allah gave me three sons. You are the third but never, ever make me angry. Latif was told that his first okay, ever assignment was going to be a football awards ceremony where Latif would be giving medals to football players, obviously, as Udi, but as it was his first ever assignment, just to make sure that he had everything completely nailed down, they decided to stage a mock rehearsal beforehand so Latif could practice. And during this rehearsal, 
Uday decided to come in and observe Latif's progress. And during the rehearsals, Uday was actually in very good spirits. He was horsing around, having a laugh. You didn't kill anyone? And he was uh... even making jokes. Right up until he made a joke that made Latif laugh out loud. Unfortunately, the way Latif laughed... Oh, no. ...is not the way Uday would have laughed. Oh, no. Uday, in a flash, went from joking and laughing to a complete blinding rage and started beating Latif all over his body with an iron bar. Latif managed to recover from his injuries just in time for the event and managed to pull it off without a hitch. Uday congratulated him personally and told him that he passed his first test. There was another event that Latif had to attend as Uday and that was a party that army officers were having to oh. celebrate the end of the Iran-Iraq war. However, as Latif and his bodyguards were entering the building, assassins, who obviously thought Latif was Uday, opened fire on them with AK-47s and Latif was hit in the shoulder. Oh. The bodyguards returned fire and killed the assassins and Latif was immediately driven to the hospital to get treatment. As a reward for catching a bullet, Uday actually told Latif that he had exactly half an hour to go and see his family. So Latif immediately... Wow. I mean, that's the, probably a pretty good reward for the boy. Kind of, kind of shit, it's only like half an hour. Immediately ran out of the hospital to spend what precious little time he had with his family. And they were pretty fucking shocked to see him because they <laughs> thought he was dead. A while later, Uday hey, decided almost. that he wanted a little vacation. So he asked Latif if he would like to come with him. And Latif agreed. So Uday, Latif and a bunch of bodyguards all went to this very posh, fancy hotel. And they were sitting next to the swimming pool smoking cigars. Until oh, Uday's eyes were drawn to a happy couple sitting across the pool. Uday learned that the happy couple were in fact newlyweds who were on their honeymoon. Oh, they had no. actually only been married one... This dude's gonna pull a fucking Robert Baratheon and fuck the wife of someone that's just gotten married. That's fucked up, brother. That is fucked up. Today, Uday ordered his bodyguards to bring him the girl. Latif begged Uday to leave the girl alone, telling him that she was just married and on her honeymoon. Uday was pretty pissed off that Latif would dare question him in such a way. The Uday ordered Latif to accompany him and the girl oh. to his room, at which point Uday forced Latif to sit in the adjacent room so that Latif was forced to hear Uday raping the girl. When Uday was finished and got off the woman, she immediately ran over to the window, opened it, and leapt to her death. Her husband, who was outside at the time, ran over to see what all the commotion was, just to see his new wife lying dead on the ground. A few weeks later, the... More like his old wife now, because she did, but... That was the wrong time to make that joke. Oh, oof, ah, ah. That's very fucked up. Ah, that's, that is brutal. Hope this dude died at some point, please. That would be a pretty happy ending. The father of the woman was brought into Uday's office because he had been the arrested father? by Uday's bodyguards because he was going around telling everyone what Uday had done. Oh. And Latif was actually in Uday's office when the father was brought in. The father immediately started screaming at Uday, calling him every single name under the sun. And then this brave, brave motherfucker spit in Uday's face. Ooh. Uday flew into an absolute rage and grabbed his gun, <laughs> but instead of shooting the father himself, Uday passed the gun to Latif and ordered him to kill the guy. So Latif had two options. Refuse and be killed himself, or carry out the order and shoot an innocent man. Latif had decided that he had had enough and he wanted to go out on his own terms. Oh. So Latif grabbed a knife that was sitting on the desk and slashed his own wrists. Uday flew into a rage, shot the father in the head himself, and then started screaming at Latif. Latif, though, ended up losing consciousness because of blood loss. But instead of just letting Latif die, or ordering that Latif be killed, Uday actually ordered that Latif be taken to hospital and nursed back to health just so Uday could force him to continue being his body double. But then shortly after that... Should've just killed the dude, brother. If you're gonna go out, at least go out like hero. Just, you know, pop the Uday guy. You have the gun, right? I mean, 
fucked up situation though. The first Gulf War started and Latif was being driven to near the Kuwait border for a TV appearance as Udi. But while they were driving there, his convoy came under attack by assassins who were firing on them from both sides. During the attack, a grenade was actually thrown oh. at the car Latif was in and the resulting explosion badly damaged Latif's hand, almost blowing his pinky finger off and Latif himself was actually shot several times. The security team suffered heavy losses, but they managed to fight off and kill the attackers. This event was the closest that Latif had ever come to dying. Latif woke up in the hospital. Besides the slitting wrist thing, right? Because that, that's pretty close to dying, right? And Udi Hussein was there, and he was laughing and clapping and patting Latif on the back, telling him that he did a very good job. Udi then turned around to the doctor and asked him if Latif was going to be okay. The doctor then told Udi that due to the damage Latif had suffered to his hand, he was most likely going to lose his pinky finger. Udi was obviously very unhappy about this because if Latif lost his pinky finger, then it would mean that Latif could no longer serve as Udi's body double. So Udi flew into a rage, pulled out his gun, Killed the doctor. put it against the doctor's head, and demanded that the doctor fix the pinky finger. After the first Gulf War ended, Udi went back to business as usual, you know, partying, drinking, and raping. Until one night, in a nightclub, one of Udi's chosen girls tried to get it on with Latif. Latif told the girl no, he wasn't interested because they were forbidden from sleeping with Udi's girls. Udi heard about this, and so, in the middle of the night, ordered his bodyguards to drag Latif out of his bed and bring him into Udi's office. Udi Shouldn't he be- Asked Latif what happened between him and the girl, and Latif assured him absolutely nothing. Udi didn't believe him, and told Latif, I'll send you to be a little bit happy. Which is a phrase that Udi liked to use a lot. What Udi meant by this phrase was, I'm sending you to the torture chambers. Oh, Latif then went through the 21 fuck? whole- oh, Jesus, this fucking bitch fucked my boy up. At least, did she get tortured as well? Whole days of the most fucking hoes. Brutal and grueling torture that a Saddam era Iraqi prison can offer. And the only reason he got released was because he really didn't want to actually lose his body double and the guards and torturers of the prison called Udi and said if you don't come down to get this guy right now he's gonna, he's die. gonna die. Latif's body was absolutely broken from the torture and he needed a lot of time off so that he could recover and get better so that he could be Udi's body double again. So Udi actually allowed Latif time to recover with his family. Oh. It was during this time that Latif told his family that he planned to escape and flee Iraq because he knew that continuing to be Uday's body double was going to be the death of him. But on the very night that Latif planned to escape, Uday called him and invited him to a party at a nightclub. Knowing what would happen if he said no, Latif had to cancel his plans and go to the party. So Latif was at the nightclub and then Uday arrived. With a Wouldn't they just, you know, kill his family if he tried to escape? Please tell me his family did not betray my boy. Oh, that would be fucked up. Please, please don't do that. A big iron bar. And Udi was just walking through the nightclub, whacking people with it completely oh. at random. He then walks over to Latif and starts kicking him, saying, the time has come, the time has come. Latif didn't know what Udi meant by that. But Latif panicked, thinking that Udi knew about his escape plans. So Latif just ran. Udi started chasing after Latif, ordering him to come back. And Latif managed to run into an elevator and started frantically pushing the button so that the doors would close. Unfortunately, Udi caught up with him and started firing into the elevator and hit Latif in the shoulder. Latif used his Same own sidearm to return fire oh. and Udi ducked and took cover. And it was while Udi was taking cover that the elevator doors finally closed and took Latif down to the ground floor. Latif ran out of the nightclub, jumped into his own car and sped away, all while under heavy fire from Uday's bodyguards. Latif drove for the border and there was only one final hurdle standing between him and freedom. And that was a military checkpoint. Yeah, it's a, it's a, small, a small hurdle, small hurdle. Just a fucking military checkpoint. Probably after the war, there's like 20 people there, maybe 50 people there. Now the problem was, Latif had absolutely no ID, 
and he was also bleeding very heavily from the gunshot wound in his shoulder. So he thought that there was absolutely no way he was going to get through. I just pre pretend to be the dude you're pretending to be. Then no one's going to do anything to you. And he was going to be caught, arrested and sent to the torture chambers again. Until he realised that he had actually been handed a golden ticket for his escape. And he'd been handed it by Uday himself. So Latif just lit a big cigar, drove right up to the military checkpoint and said, Sup y'all. I'm Udi Hussein. <laughs> let me fucking through. The guards all immediately saluted him and let him pass. No questions asked. From there, Latif was able to sneak into Turkey and finally to freedom. Udi uh. approached Latif's family and demanded that they order him to come back to Iraq. Uh. But Latif's family refused. They're dead. And because they refused, Udi actually murdered Latif's father. He paid a heavy price. And I'm proud of him. And I know he's in heaven. Fortunately, the rest of the family was spared. Oof. Latif now works as a successful businessman in Europe. I felt the need to include the story of Latif Yahya because I feel it gives a very good insight into just how maniacal and evil Uday Hussein really was. And Latif's story was actually even adapted into a movie released in 2011 oh. called The Devil's Double. Uh, uh, shit. Another oh. man who managed to escape the regime oh. was a man called Abbas al Junabi, who was one of Udi Hussein's closest associates oh. and also his personal press secretary. When he managed to flee the regime, he opened up about all kinds of atrocities that Udi Hussein had committed, primarily his repeated rape of women, some of whom were as young as 12. He sometimes like to. Rape, rape. Yes, raping is one of his, let me say, hobbies. One of his hobbies yes. is raping. Yes. And I am I... not exaggerating. Al Janabi also confirmed that during the first Gulf War, Udi Hussein himself was directly involved in the torture of American POWs. But all of that it's not surprising barely at all. scratches the surface of what a evil, twisted piece of shit. Uday Hussein was. He did many, many, many more horrible things and it's a bit hard to discern what order these things took place in so I'm just going to present them to you as a list in no particular order. So let's have a little bit of a deep dive into some of the most horrendous shit that Uday Hussein has done. After the first Gulf War there was an attempted uprising against Saddam Hussein and Udi was directly involved in dealing with the prisoners and apparently uh, during a visit to a prison that was holding a lot of these prisoners from the uprising, Udi, on a whim, just ordered that half of them be executed. Udi then took one of the prisoners from the surviving half and, right in front of all of them, plunged an electric drill into the man's head. Udi then ordered that the corpses be left Oi. in the cells with the surviving ah, prisoners aye. as a form of psychological torture. You might be surprised to hear this, but Udi actually loved his mother very, very much and was very devoted to her and held her in high regard. So when Saddam Hussein took a second wife, Udi saw that as an insult to his mother. And Uday personally blamed a man called Kamel Gegio, who was Saddam Hussein's personal food taster and valet. Uday blamed Kamel because he was the one that introduced Saddam to his second wife. Oh. So, at a party in 1988, and possibly under the instruction of his mother, Uday Hussein brutally murdered Kamel in front of horrified guests with an electric carving knife. As punishment What's for up this... with electric weapons? This dude's in a zombie apocalypse game. Uh, what was that game called where you can craft weapons? This dude's crafting all the electric weapons. Saddam did actually imprison Udi oh. and sentenced him to death, but Saddam released him after just three months and banished him to Switzerland to, in the hope that he would somehow stay out of trouble there. Unfortunately, while he was in Switzerland, Udi Hussein kept getting into fights and kept getting arrested by the Swiss authorities. And when they got sick of him, they just kicked him out of Switzerland. So Udi ended up coming back to Iraq. However, as further punishment for this, Saddam Hussein ordered that Udi's entire fleet of luxury cars were to be burned. 
Udi was later appointed as chairman of the Iraqi Olympic Committee, which pretty much gave him oversight on all of Iraq's sports teams, primarily the Iraqi football team. And he treated the players exactly as you would expect, beating them, humiliating them, and even sending them to the torture chambers for losing games. Sharar Haydar was a player who was on the Iraqi football team, and when they lost to Jordan, Udi actually sent him to prison. Well, they took me straight away to the prison, and uh, every single day I've been beating my feet, and uh, 20 a day, and I'm not allowed to eat or drink, just a glass of water and a piece of uh, bread. Another account comes from one of the Iraqi Olympic weightlifters who Udi actually sent to the torture chamber because he didn't bring home a gold medal. They use special sticks, electric sticks, pipes filled with stones. You have no idea how brutal these guys are. Udi had all kinds of imaginative punishments in mind when it came to punishing these athletes. On one occasion, he apparently forced the football team to kick around a solid concrete ball because they failed to qualify for the 1994 FIFA World Cup final. It was also claimed that Udi even had some athletes dragged through gravel and then dumped into raw sewage so that their wounds would become infected. Uday's methods of torture became more brutal and grotesque as time went Jesus. on. He did things like chopping off people's ears, cutting out people's tongues, burying them in coffins, and even on quite a few occasions, taking welders' torches to people's faces. And the reason that his torture techniques were becoming more brutal and grotesque as time went on is because Uday had discovered the internet and he would spend a lot of time on the internet looking up and researching all of these horrible torture techniques so that he could try them out in real life Jesus on people Christ. he was torturing. Uday's staff were actually quoted as saying that the day Uday learned to use the internet was a dark day for Iraq. Another incident that apparently occurred was when a travelling troop of Russian ballerinas were in Iraq for a performance. Oh no. Ud- oh, no. They invited one of the girls and her instructor to come to his room for a party. Obviously, there was no party, and Udi and his bodyguards forced the girl and her instructor to have sex with each other at gunpoint while Udi filmed the entire thing, and when they were finished, Udi took the girl into the next room and raped her. It was even confirmed by Latif Yahya himself that Uday's absolute degeneracy went even further than rape. He actually confirmed that Uday couldn't get off unless the girl was screaming and bleeding. This is Uday. Uday, he can't sleep with a woman if he don't hit her and see the blood coming out of her. So that for him is the sexual excitement. Yeah, the violence. Udi also abducted the 14-year-old daughter of a former provincial governor and sexually assaulted her for three days. When her father went public with what Udi had done, Udi sent him a message saying that the man was to hand both of his daughters over to Udi or Udi would wipe them all from the face of the earth. A few days later, the man handed his daughters over to Udi. But the most fucked up thing that Udi would do... Worse than this? The thing he was most well known for, and the thing that he was most hated for, was driving around Baghdad at night looking for weddings that were happening. He would walk into the wedding with his bodyguards, kidnap the bride, take her back to his room, rape her, and then dump her in the street. And Udi did this countless times. The people of Iraq hated Udi. A lot of them hated him even more than Saddam, which made him the prime target for assassination. And in 1996, assassins nearly got him. One day while driving in a fleet of Mercedes, Udi and his bodyguards were attacked by a rebel group called Al Nada, who were hellbent on killing Udi. They fired upon the convoy with AK-47s and also threw grenades. A lot of Udi's bodyguards were wiped out and Udi himself was shot eight times. One of the bullets ended up getting lodged in Udi's spine and because of its location it was impossible for surgeons to operate on it, which meant that Udi now walked with a permanent limp. 
this is the thing that kind of makes Uday different from other evil people in history. Other evil people in history did evil things because they had a goal. And the evil thing that they wanted to do was simply the fastest way for them to... Yeah, there's some people that didn't have a goal. There's a lot of fucked up people in history. Achieve that goal and they really did not give the tiniest shit about the human suffering that they caused in the process. So these evil people in the past, you know, they committed evil acts because they were callous and horrible individuals, but they also at least had some kind of goal they were looking to achieve. But Uday sort of did that the opposite way around, where he would have a goal he wanted to achieve, and then he would actively make the method of achieving that goal as evil as he could possibly make it. I mean, if he wanted to have sex with a woman, he could go down to any nightclub and any woman would want to go into bed True. with the son of the great dictator. Okay, any woman would have wanted to do that. You know, women like power. They dig that shit. <laughs> they dig but that he would shit. drive around looking for weddings to kidnap the woman, to take her and rape her because he wanted sex. So this man, I don't think he even cared about the goal. He just wanted to Wait, be... did he have a goal? What was his goal? Become the most hated person ever? Evil, and that's what makes Udi a bit different from other people. As in, Udi actively went out of his way to be as evil as he possibly could be, which makes him probably one of the biggest pieces of shit in history. Saddam Hussein knew everything. He knew everything his son had been up to, he knew everything his son had been doing, and he just allowed him to continue the way he was. But get this. Saddam stated that Uday Hussein would not be inheriting the dictatorship oh, when he passed. Saddam stated that it would actually be his second-born son, Kusey, Hussein, who would be inheriting the dictatorship. The reason for this was because Saddam thought that Uday was too evil to have that much power and did not want him Brother. to inherit the dictatorship. And I want you to just think about that for a yeah. second. Saddam Hussein, one of evil. the most evil dictators to ever have existed, thought himself that Uday was too evil to Jesus become Christ. the next dictator. I mean, I mean, when Saddam fucking Hussein tells you you're too evil, you know you fucked up. There were other factors that did contribute to Uday not getting the dictatorship. For example, the fact that he walked with a permanent limp apparently made him look weak in the eyes of... Is the second son as bad as this dude as well? Or is he a little bit not this much of a cunt the people and also Saddam did not approve of his flamboyant mannerisms which I actually do kind of find a little bit funny you you want to be dictator nah man you gay <laughs> Uday was furious that he had been sidelined and inheriting the dictatorship and slowly but surely over time he found himself being excluded more and more from Ooh. the governmental process and the government people that once flocked around Uday had now left him and were flocking around in brown nose and Kusey because Kusey was going to be the next leader. Uday knew that despite the fact that he could do whatever he wanted, he knew there would be serious repercussions if he tried to kill Kusey. Killing Kusey was one of the few things that he would not get away with. So he just had to sit back and accept that Kusey would inherit the dictatorship. That does not sound so like him. So the regime him. carried on as usual, but with all of the attention on Kusey, and in the background, Uday was doing his usual of Crazy drinking, shit. partying, killing and raping like the massive piece of shit that he was. And that continued for many years, until finally, Someone freedom came knocking. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. America, fuck yeah! I'm not going to go into too much detail about the American invasion of Iraq, but what happened was all of Iraq's elite went into hiding because they knew that they were wanted men, and American forces had actually been given the infamous Iraq's most wanted playing cards, which had the photos and names of all of the most wanted people in Iraq. Uh, sadly, That's one way to do it. These are just replicas because the original ones are actually collector's items now yeah. and are worth quite a bit of money. And uh, I know a lot of veterans watch me, so I hope you kept yours. 
Despite their differences, uh, Udi and Kusi actually went into hiding together in a villa that they commandeered from the owner that was located in Mosul. And it was in there that they were laying low and trying to uh, figure out a way that they could escape. This cannot end well, can it? Who's gonna kill who? Cape Iraq and the pursuing American forces. However, American forces were tipped off oh. to Udi and Kusi's location. And a lot of people think that it was the owner of the villa that told American forces where they were. The reason people think this is because the villa owner and his family had disappeared from Iraq and suddenly, miraculously, appeared in America and they were also $30 million richer. Mm. Um, but, I'm, but I'm sure that's just a coincidence. <laughs> so on the 22nd of July, 2003, uh, yeah, good for them. JSOC Task Force 20, with the assistance of the 101st Airborne Division, began an operation to raid the villa. During reconnaissance, American forces discovered that there were four occupants in the villa. Udi, Kusi, a bodyguard, and Kusi's son, and the intent of the operation was to capture them all alive. Udi and Kusi were Saddam's only two sons, and that made them very high-value targets, so the American forces pulled out all the stops to make sure that there was no way this mission could go wrong. They went in with over 200 US troops, OH-58 Kiowa Jesus. helicopters and an A-10 Warthog. They were, they were really making sure that there was no <laughs> escape for these guys. American forces surrounded the villa and told the occupants to come outside with their hands up. But the occupants of the villa instead opened fire on the American forces and the American forces returned oh, no. fire. And this started a firefight which lasted for about four hours. Really? Udi and Kusi used heavy machine guns and AK-47s to fight back against the American forces. Uh, four American soldiers actually tried to sneak into the compound and reach an entrance behind the house. Uh, unfortunately, one of the occupants, we still don't know who, dropped a grenade out of the window on top of the US soldiers and they were seriously wounded. Oh, they survived. Eventually, okay. American forces just went, do you know what? Fuck this. We're America. And Bank? started pounding the villa with tow missiles and strafing it with the helicopters. <laughs> then after 10 direct Jesus. hits with the tow missiles and after half the villa had collapsed, the gunfire from inside stopped and American forces moved in and they recovered from the rubble the bodies of Kusi they killed them all. and Udi. Four persons were killed during that operation and were removed from the building. And we have since confirmed that Uday and Kuse Hussein are among the dead. Uday's death was publicly announced. And that very night, and for many nights after that, Everyone celebratory did. gunfire could be heard <laughs> all throughout Baghdad. The people of Iraq were absolutely thrilled that that motherfucker was dead. Uday was buried in a cemetery near Tikrit. I just thought I would let you know in case you need a piss. Shortly afterwards, American forces raided Uday's mansion and they found all of the standard, stereotypical things that you would expect to find in a dictator's son's house. They found fleets of luxury oh. and expensive cars. They found pet cheetahs and lions. They found a... My oh, boy's got pet cheetahs and lions. I don't think we even have cheetahs in our zoo here. Bunch of guns that were made out of gold. And they also found wow. $650 million <laughs> in cash hidden in the walls of the mansion. Now, you may have noticed, this video uh, wasn't that funny, was it? Uh. <laughs> like, I tried, I tried to put my funny spin on it, but I just couldn't do it. But I felt kind of hard to make compelled spin. to make this video anyway, because I think it serves as a very important example of the type of evil that totalitarian governments can unleash upon the world. And totalitarian governments is the exact type of thing that I've been trying to warn everybody about for years now. When the government has absolute control over you and it is in no way held accountable by its people, you get things like torture, you get things like executions, you get things like mass incarceration, you get things like Udi. So that's why I continued to make the video anyway, to remind everyone that freedom is just... <clears throat> love freedom! Love freedom! I love freedom so fucking much, I want to be able to open carry and smoke weed at my gay trans black friend's wedding that they paid for with Bitcoin. I love freedom. I fucking love freedom. And the alternatives we have to freedom okay. can unleash unspeakable evil upon the world.
Now, despite me using Udi Hussein as an excellent example as to why freedom is fucking fantastic and why governments should always be held accountable by their people, that absolutely doesn't take away from the fact... That Udi Hussein was the worst mad lad I ever had the misfortune <laughs> of writing. I mean, at least at least General Butt Naked with his heroin huffing child soldiers. I saw that. I, 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 I saw that General Butt Naked thing. I know people have been requesting it. I was a little afraid to click it, okay? I gotta be honest. I was a little afraid. Brother, I, did y'all see the thumbnail picture of that thing? I, I am afraid to click that fucking video. At least had the absurdity factor to make it somewhat comical. Oh no, but not Udi. No, 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 not not Udi. Udi, Udi was just a straight up piece of shit. There was nothing funny. There was nothing absurd. The man just actively went out of his way to try and be the most evil motherfucker on earth to the point where he was that pathetic that he basically used that. I'm gonna use daddy's money and daddy's power to get to get fucking cars and and Bucci and all that. He was a pathetic piece of shit. Right? He doesn't deserve the title of Mad Lad at all. The only reason he is in Mad Lads is because he served as a good example of why government should always be held accountable by the people. Udi Hussein, I award you no points and I'm glad you're fucking dead. <laughs> right, just like a lot of the people. I'm pretty sure. oh. Jesus. Fuck's sake. What you doing, my brother? Fuck. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> I practiced this. I fuck it. I fucking practiced this. Fuck it. Fuck it. Fuck it. I'm just. I'm just gonna show the card. I'm just gonna show the card. I'm not sure what he was trying to do, but. But count thank you on YouTube. Everybody just. God damn, that was one hell of a video. Oof. Jesus Christ! I was not, I, I was expecting bad stuff when I clicked on this video. I was not expecting this bad of stuff. Like this was this was a little fucked up. I gotta be honest. This was this was, this was extremely fucked up. Oof. Okay, well we got it. We did the. We did the video. Anyway, quick thank you to the patrons. Pedro Martinez, Commander, Scorion, Robert, Prince, Swastik, Fuel, Chicken, Future, Senior, Hilton, Lemon, Moon, Night, Madash, Ronnie, Not the James Zone. Thank you all for the support. We'll be doing some room world in an hour. I'm not sure. It's probably going to be uploaded after the room world stream. So, yeah. Hope y'all enjoyed this. And I'll be back next time with something else. See y'all.